Great, thank you, Francis. Um, and, and thank you to the organizers of, of this session. I've, I've found it extremely stimulating, um, really interesting ideas that um, get applied in different fields and you know, see the vast array of applications that these ideas have. So I, I'm gonna talk about kind of bridging between uh, the worlds of, of, of economics and ecology. Um, this picture here, this actually came from uh, um, uh, the, uh, the front of the, uh, the cover of The Economist magazine in 2005, shortly after uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment uh, released, its, uh, released its report. Um, and I, I think the idea here is that, you know, the economy is actually embedded in nature, you know, the economy happens on Earth. We need to care about Earth systems and the linkages between the economy and Earth systems. Um, and uh, you know, one way of thinking about this is that uh, these Earth systems, these biodiversity, are incredibly important forms of, of natural capital. Um, and one of the things that motivates me, so you know, question why try to value uh, biodiversity? Well, we realize that. Uh, and, and Elena uh, kind of showed this in, in her slides, that economic activity is causing a rapid decline in biodiversity or otherwise stated as natural capital, that loss of biodiversity threatens human well-being. And if we're going to uh, reverse this or address this, you know, one, uh, one necessary condition is actually to make visible what currently is often invisible in government and, and, and business circles. So you know, showing what the uh, the importance or the value um, of this biodiversity actually is. Um, I'll just say there have been a number of very high profile reports. So starting at the upper left with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in 2005, um, I just collected a, a, a number of these. Um, many of these are quite recent. So the 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 bottom four, uh, the, excuse me, the the Four on the bottom row to the right are all from 2021 uh, or later. And these you know, from the UN, uh, from the World Bank, from the UK government, which commissioned Partha Desgupta to talk about the economics of biodiversity, from the World Economic Forum. So, so this is, you know, the, the, this is getting, you know, this is our time to talk about natural capital and the value of, of biodiversity. Um, so in thinking about uh, you know, how an economist might approach this question of the value of biodiversity, there, there's really been two strands of literature. They're related, but they're, they're somewhat different. And so I want to talk about each in turn. The first really takes the notion of diversity seriously, much in the way that we've talked about it uh, here. So you know, let's think about a measure either of species diversity or genetic diversity uh, or ecosystem diversity in the way that Elena talked about it. Um, and show that a change in this kind of measure diversity is linked to some uh, economic value. The second, which um, I have to say is the dominant strain of literature now puts biodiversity kind of in the background. Uh, so some people they'll say the value of biodiversity and really what they mean is sort of the value of nature or natural capital. So kind of biodiversity is synonymous with nature and show how nature uh, contributes to human well-being. This is called nature's contribution to people or ecosystem services. So let me talk about that first notion, that value of diversity. And I'm, I'm, I'm skimming over a, a large set of literature, but I'll, I'll give you two examples. One from the genetic level or genetic diversity and, and the notion of kind of bioprospecting, or we think that there's are interesting uh, genetic information out there that might lead to, let's say, pharmaceuticals or other things. Um, and then a, a, a second, thinking about how species diversity contributes to ecological functions that then provide these valuable um, ecosystem services. So on the first one, you know, we might think that there are interesting uh, genetic com or biological compounds um, in different species, um, you know, clearly uh, interests in, in, in drug companies looking for um, interesting uh, biological material. The greater the number of species that you have, uh, the greater chance that at least one of these species contains uh, this biological compound. So it's kind of like, you know, the more trials or the more chances that you get or options that you have. Um, but there was kind of a, a paradox here. Uh, so in the 1990s, people were quite excited about this as potentially providing a, 
a reason for thinking that this would this would provide uh, value for uh, conserving species. But uh, this paper uh, by David Simpson and, and co-authors um, showing that you know the value of species conservation is actually low when there's a lot of species. You know the the chance that one species has something that n minus one species don't becomes quite small as as n grows large. But that treats all species as having equal probability of success, but there are differences uh, among species and, and uh, some species are quite unique. So if we really thought about the diversity of those species, the genetic diversity of those species, then some species without close rel relatives, we would think are sort of more unique and hence more valuable. There's a chance that they have some compound that other species do not. Um, so if we thought about uh, applying this then, it's not just the number of species, but the diversity of the species where we care about uh, how dissimilar uh, various species are from, from one another. And so in work that I did with uh, Andy Solo, um, uh, we, we looked at, at, at this notion and thought about, you know, what's the probability that a set of species uh, contains a certain characteristic? So this is a kind of a probabilistic model. Um, you you, you need to put on a lot of structure if you really want the probabilities, but you can also uh, look at this and get sort of a lower bound on this probability with a very general uh, parametric model. And that's what I'll talk about here. So there's a, a, a lower bound called Gallo's inequality, but basically, and I'm sorry for the math here. I, I didn't really have time to clean up the slide, but basically what this means is that if, if you take the pairwise dissimilarities between any two species and you form a matrix out of this, and you could think about um, the, the inverse of that matrix, basically what it does is it captures the, um, what I'll call the effective number of species. The, so if I have a lot of species, but they're very, very similar, that's effectively like having one species. But if I have uh, those same set of species and they're quite dissimilar, then, then effectively I have N species. And so that's what, this, that's what this gets at. And I'll just give you a quick example. So this is on the lower left is a, is a group of species, um, and um, sort of the represented in, in, in two-dimensional space, kind of the, the genetic distance between these species. And the, the idea here is, you know, we could, we could have a measure of like, what's the chance that all of these, or, you know, what's the value of having all of these species, all 26 of these, versus what's the, the, the uh, value of having just three, which are at the very extremes of this. So kind of at the, if you, if you look at this as a triangle, like, you just have three species that are at the kind of outer vertex of this triangle uh, versus you had like eight species, but they're all clumped up at the top of this diagram. And so uh, what the measure here is, is, is shows that you can get, um, if, if for example, the dissimilarity matters a lot, then just having, for example, three species, if you look at that middle column there, having three species captures a lot of what is present in this whole 26 uh, species. Okay, shifting slightly, um, thinking about not at the genetic level, but how species diversity leads to uh, increased in ecological function, which may be uh, related therefore to um, ecosystem services that, that we care about. Um, so this is work uh, with, with my colleague, uh, Dave Tillman, uh, who's done a lot of work linking uh, diversity, species diversity, and ecological function. So the left of this diagram shows what happens in a homogeneous environment. And so each of these dots is actually a draw. And, and you'll see that, and this is, this is just a, a simulation, but in a homogeneous environment, the best species, the, the species which is best matched to the environmental conditions does, as, you know, does perfectly well. So you don't have a lot of necessarily value of diversity if you pick well. Uh, but on the right, you have a variable or heterogeneous environment, and there, no individual species will do as well across the range of conditions. And so this is something you know, Scott Page and, and Simon started with, which is the world is uncertain. There are a variety of conditions, and diversity is extremely important uh, to cover those range of, of conditions. Well, well, that's theory, but, but uh, Dave Tillman has done a lot of work uh, actually showing this uh, empirically. Uh, so Cedar Creek uh, 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 Biological Station, just outside the Twin Cities in Minnesota, 
Um, and he has shown that on the bottom here is the, the number of species in a plot and on the vertical axis is the, how, how much, in this case, above ground biomass. And you can see that in different years here, but, but the general trend is that you get uh, that that more diverse systems outperform less diverse systems, and that there are a variety of different ways that he's uh, shown this and, and tested this. So this is total biomass. The, the previous one was above ground biomass. Okay, I want to shift gears. So so that's you know again linking particular uh, measures of diversity, species diversity or genetic diversity, to a particular kind of value to uh, people our economic value. Um, more recently, there's been an explosion of literature on the sort of value of nature. And again, biodiversity is there, but it's not uh, front and center. Um, and this is, uh, so people call this ecosystem services or nature's contributions to people. There recently was uh, uh, important uh, global assessment by IPBES, which stands for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Um, one of the things that came out of that assessment uh, is if we look over the past 50 years, what have been the trends in important globally, uh, in important ecosystem services. So each row here, apologize it's small, I don't I'm not going to talk about each row individually, but each row is a different type of, of uh, contribution. So we have regulating uh, 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 services and material and non-material services. And the orange indicates that the trend has been downward over the past 50 years globally. Uh, the blue is an, is, is an increase. Actually, one of the interesting things uh, from an economic point of view is that th those things which are, do show up in markets that have market value primarily material uh, goods and services, are the ones that tend to do better, have shown less decline. And in fact, uh, many of those have increased over the last 50 years. But if you don't pay for them, the regulatory and non-material, those have generally declined. Um, so a, a number of us have worked at actually quantifying, uh, so modeling and quantifying uh, these. So in the Natural Capital Project, we've we've worked to uh, have a model called integrated valuation of ecosystem services and trade-offs. I'll just give you one um, application or example of this. And this is actually, uh, since I knew I was going to be talking uh, here to a number of Chinese colleagues, I, I, I wanted to show an example that was led by colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, and particularly the leadership of, of uh, Professor Uyang um, on what we call uh, what he really has has pioneered called gross ecosystem product. Um, okay, so we all know about GDP or gross domestic product, the kind of standard measure uh, that economists use of how an economy is performing, which measures the, the flow of goods and services in an economy over a certain time period, usually annually. But these are, these are marketed goods and services. Um, what if we instead looked at what is nature contributing? Now, what are, what are the value of these ecosystem services, ecosystem goods and services? Now, some of these are marketed, so agricultural output or forestry, et cetera, fisheries. So some of that is already captured in GDP, but there are many of these values um, of ecosystem services or nature's contributions that are not valued in the market. And so they don't show up in GDP, but they clearly contribute to human well-being. So, there's overlap between these two measures, but there are many parts of nature's contributions which are frankly invisible in standard economic accounting. So we set out to uh, do this in, uh, in China. So you need to, first of all, think about you know, the, the, the status conditions of the natural capital. How does that translate into flows of ecosystem goods and services? What is the value of those goods and services? So what's the price of them? And then aggregate these up into a measure, an aggregate measure of GDP, being careful not to uh, double count. So this builds on earlier work, um, again, led by colleagues at the Chinese Academy of Sciences on, on quantifying the flows of ecosystem services. Um, then we apply this, uh, in this particular case, in, in Qinghai province in, in Western China. Uh, just to prove I'm an economist, I can, I can show a, a, a chart with numbers that is in, impenetrable, but basically the idea here is that each row is, a, is an ecosystem services and we've, we've valued them 
both in physical terms and in value terms, economic value terms, in 2000 and in 2015, and looked and see how they how they changed. Now, China is actually uh, planning to implement this across China, um, so not just in Qinghai, but um, at the provincial level, um, city and county level, and then all across all of China. This is an example showing you we, we can demonstrate where the supply of ecosystem services originates and where the beneficiaries um, of those ecosystem services lie. So just to wrap up, um, you know, thinking about the, the road ahead, there are many reasons why biodiversity contributes uh, to people. So instead of calling it nature's contribution to people, here I'll re refer to BCP or biodiversity's contributions to people. Many of these are invisible. Um, there is a rapid loss of biodiversity. And so my feeling is that there's an urgent need to actually make visible this. So having better metrics of value and better incorporating these um, into decision-making. So thanks very much. <laughs>